All right, thank you. So um, yeah, first off, I'd like to open and acknowledge Dries for presenting the opening for Drupal South 2021. It was uh, really, really nice to see how humble and grounded Dries uh, is and presents. Um, I'd also like to thank all volunteers and guests for being a part of this new event in this new format and particularly under these tough times. So hello, my name is Alfred Deeb and I am the founding director of Salsa Digital is a GovTech company that is really focused on helping governments become more open, more connected and more consolidated. I'm really pleased to introduce this next session. Uh, it's a panel discussion on Drupal's place in the Australian government. Uh, so to give some context, uh, among the many responsibilities of our government, our public servants are responsible to, for delivering us citizens, you know, quality information services that is easy to find and easy to understand. Thanks to some key influences, leading digital authorities and digital pirates within government, open source has become a big part of many official digital standards, policies and guidelines. You combine this fact with a powerful content management system supported by a highly engaged community, it should be of no surprise that Drupal has become the choice for government in Australia to deliver us our information and services. To celebrate Drupal's 20th year anniversary, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce today's government panel made of digital leaders on behalf of the key jurisdictions using Drupal as their whole of government CMS. On behalf of the Federal Department of Finance and GovCMS, we have Mr. Nathan Wall. On behalf of the Western Australian government, we have Mr. Bill Bell. And on behalf of the fine state of Victoria, no bias, uh, and the single digital presence, we have Ms. Philippa Nihil, uh, AKA PIP. And to facilitate this panel discussion is my colleague, Mr. Akil Bandari. Thank you all, and I wish you a great event. Uh, over to you, Akil. Thank you, Alfred, for the introduction to the panel and session. And thank you all for your time to attend this year's Drupal Short events. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of ACT, which is where I am, the Nonamal people, and acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and contribution they make to the life and the city of this region. So uh, as Alfred mentioned, my name is Akhil Bandari and I work for Salsa Digital and I work with Drupal. So in this session, we're going to look at Drupal success in Australia and in particular, its rise in government in recent years. As mentioned in an earlier session with Dries, Drupal is suited uh, well as an enterprise CMS, which makes it ideal for government, especially in recent years where Australian government jurisdictions have been adopting it in various distinct flavours to advance Australia's digital innovation. Now, today we have some of those government agencies represented on our panel um, to show how they've, uh, how Drupal has helped them solve challenges and their users uh, to meet their user needs and to succeed. As Alfred mentioned today, we have Bill Bell um, from the Department of Premier and Cabinet for the Western Australian Government. And we have Nathan Wall from the Federal Department of Finance and Pip Nihil from uh, Victorian Government's uh, Single Digital Presence Program. Thank you all very much today to take time to speak with us. Now, the format we have, we have five questions that we'll ask each of our panelists and provide an opportunity to uh, answer them. And you, uh, as the audience, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A feature in the session here, um, and we'll try and answer them as we go along. We'll also leave some extra time at the end of the session to answer some general questions. So first question uh, for each of you is, where did you start with Drupal and what was growth like working with Drupal? Uh, I might start with you maybe, Bill, um, with Western Australian government that runs native Drupal for its websites. So um, how did you guys start or give us a bit of information um, there? So I'm part of the, well, I lead the platform team for a uh, digital government within DPC. Um, in 2016, the state, um, a, finished and published its first whole of government digital strategy. And of course, part of that was a, uh, a citizen centric services. And the state didn't actually have any citizen centric or one portal for citizens to go to. We were, were still, we, we were, and for the major part still are uh, agency driven. So a citizen must go to an agency and then another agency to actually get government services. So, Part of that strategy was we needed one portal or at least a couple of central portals. So we looked around, we did an alpha. The alpha was done in WordPress because we made sure that a, um, whatever alpha we were going to a, um, a develop and then they ask our citizens what they wanted, we, we couldn't reuse. And at that time, 
WordPress was very security prone or had security issues, so we knew we could never use it. After we got like 7,000 pieces of feedback, um, we went into procurement exercise and a uh, chose Drupal. It, it wasn't a case of just a choosing Drupal because of its say, it's secure, it's extensible, it's, it integrates, it, and also its value for money. It was the actual best platform for what we wanted it for. There were pressures outside of, of a, uh, our project to go down the proprietary path, but the story I have on, on where Drupal it, it wins the day every time is it's a open source community and the support for that platform. It doesn't matter what proprietary platform that you have, if you've got a, an active community supporting your open source platform, then, then it's very competitive. So that would be my two minutes for that, that question. <laughs> Excellent. Thank, thank you, Bill. And uh, maybe next to you, Pip. Um, Victoria has its own kind of Drupal program called the Single Digital Presence, or SDP. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about how that started or a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, and just first off the clock, that I'm coming from the lands of the Wur Wurundjeri people, and I acknowledge their elders past and present. Um, so in March 2017, Drupal 8 was selected as the content management for the Single Digital Presence. Um, I guess our implementation is slightly different to some, some where we're running headless, um, so running multiple Vue.js front ends from the one Drupal backend. Um, this has enabled us, though, to consolidate about 54 websites onto GovAU, and a further 42 websites have been transitioned across um, into the SDP platform. We've got over 500 CMS authors from across nine departments now working and using that platform. We're in good shape, but there have been a few growing pains. Um, we do have clear pathways to upgrade with the security and reliability that Drupal's offering. Um, but sometimes things that, are might, that might normally have been easy for a standard Drupal implementation haven't been so easy for us. So sometimes it does feel like we fight against Drupal a bit. Um, we now, our headless state means that we now need to put a little bit more effort into things like third-party customizations. Um, Drupal scales well. Uh, we, we still struggle sometimes with the way it's handling scale from the CMS point of view. And that is kind of our main area of work. Um, for me personally, the, working in this space now um, uh, is a real eye opener after sort of being first introduced to Drupal via a different kind of government intranet about um, 12 years ago. So at that point, Drupal was very new to us. And after a couple of days or a week of training, um, I was kind of blown away at that point about its capacity for configuration and, and, and the way that it might suit government. Um, and I think we're seeing now with the single digital presence that it really does have the capacity to suit big government implementations. No, that's excellent. And it's quite interesting that you mentioned you know, the, the headless and decoupled architecture that Dries mentioned earlier. That's um, that Drupal has the capacity to do, and it's good to see that you know uh, some of the jurisdictions are kind of playing on that and using that um, to their advantage. Yeah. Um, lastly, we'll come to you, Nathan. Um, GovCMS is probably one of the more well-known government programs. Uh, maybe you can uh, elaborate on how that started. Thanks, Akil. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners of the land. Okay. Yes, well, we quietly celebrated our six last uh, March live on the planet in um, and we're now working with it's nearly a hundred agencies uh, and departments right um, and that includes some local councils too so GovCMS actually provides uh, hosting and the actual CMS tools to basically any government entity that would, would like to use this We've got more than 330 sites on the platform. Uh, there's another 55 odd sites already in the pipeline. So you know, our growth is is ongoing. Um, um, has to create and manage some distribution at the moment. One in the process of retiring the Drupal 8 distro and yes, the Drupal 7 will be around for a little while longer. Um, but we could centrally manage that code base and it allowed the agencies coming onto the platform to focus uh, yeah, managing their content. 
is that need the information and not necessarily to have to have strong technical capabilities in-house. I mean, some of the smaller agencies in particular around government, that they, their resourcing doesn't really allow them to invest in strong technical skills. They're not big enough to actually have that in-house. Um, so the growth is, for us has also come from building that strong community around the platform. Um, we are centrally managed, yes, we do things in a, a central coordinated way, but we're community led. You know, we're highly in, involved with the agencies that are using the platform and they, they have a say in what we do and sort of where we go. Um, the growth has been constant, gradual, um, and you know, the 330 sites uh, live that we've got now doesn't, I suppose, really attest to the level of activity that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, with all the upgrade work that's been going on from moving off Drupal 7 and Drupal 8, uh, just, you know, last year alone, my team launched 145 websites. So like, there's a lot of activity going on um, and it's just been fantastic to see. And from all of the, in it's going to continue. Excellent, excellent. And that's obviously, you know, the success of using Drupal for uh, for this program. So uh, I guess the second question, and I can open this to anyone, is and what did uh, Drupal solve for you um, and has helped with your program in particular? Uh, anyone can kind of jump in. I might start with you, Pip, if there's something. Yeah, sure. Um, I think Drupal has allowed for us the very core of, of what it is that we're doing, that multi-tenancy content management system. Um, it's given us the starting point for that. And that flexibility is a massive, um, like a, a massive driver of value for this government, really. Um, it supports a really diverse array of content that meets user needs while supporting kind of rapidly changing priorities in contexts like, for instance, this current pandemic that we're going through. Um, the flexibility that we've had, particularly over the last 18 months, has just been, has been fantastic. Um, so when that comes down to, you know, a case by case kind of situation, you know, when we're looking at it, a lot of government digital presences don't necessarily require a website. A lot of them just require a presence. Um, so in that instance, it's been e Drupal's enabled us to be able to easily spin up um, these instances for them on something like GovAU. Um, we leverage um, we leverage the workflows quite heavily. Um, so roles and permissions where they don't work completely in our favour, we've extended those a bit. Um, but they provide us with the ability anyway to govern and apply standards to help improve the information that's, that gets finally published to, to Victorians. Um, yeah. Excellent. Oh, yes, one, one more thing too is yeah, that sure. it's open source nature. Um, uh, kind of the intention is that that allows us to kind of stop or limit the amount of duplication that's going on in development across government that we can harness one good idea and just reuse it many times. Yes, exactly, I guess. Yeah, the open source nature is, is probably one of the strongest points. And, um, let me, and, yeah, let me, let, let me <laughs> dive in there, Akil, because um, my sort of opening thoughts here was open source as well. Um, yep. One of the reasons why uh, Department of Finance chose Drupal, this was even before um, GovCMS really um, was being open source meant that the whole procurement exercise was a whole lot easier. Um, and it does, doesn't necessarily reduce the total cost of ownership, but it allows agencies to allocate resources into more, uh, uh, um, rewarding parts of their activity that kind of pay back sort of value rather than just paying license fees for software. Um, and we also really appreciated that there was a strong local developer community government in many instances um, and you know the private sector as Dries reflected this morning there's a lot of websites around the world are using Drupal so we were able to leverage that to give us mm -hmm. access to that skill set that the government doesn't always have in-house um, and yeah like like Pip said there's a such a range of sites and content and things that you can do um, arguably a lot of government stuff is still brochureware and that's perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with that um, but in the past few years, we've seen some of the agencies we work with do some really stunning stuff, um, visualizing data um, from very uh, stepping their toes in the water with things like content APIs. Um, and this is actually helping agencies create services that are easier to find, easier to use, and it's making government a bit more transparent and accountable. And that's always a good thing. No, that's excellent. And that whole 
nature of open source, obviously, you know, you can leverage what work has been done across different agencies uh, and then use that um, within your own site or instance that you need it. It's really good. And, uh, and speaking on, on APIs and things, I mean, maybe Bill can jump in here about um, how you guys are using uh, Drupal. Um, for us, uh, looking at it from a high level point of view, so we started off being multi tenanted right away. So we have a uh, 40 plus agencies uh, with with their entire content on it and hundreds of a campaign or a, a you know small websites a, all in all in the one platform but what it gave us was it gave us that single a portal it gave us a standardization that wcag the um the look and feel of the site well not everybody agrees with it everybody had to say on and how that site was going to look um Inadvertently, it helped us start to build whole of government operating models um, and, and SLAs between agencies. Uh, a classic one was, well, hey, our current website does this and you, you don't. Well, if you just want to upgrade, why don't you invest in that feature for everybody? And then we all benefit. So hey, and that's where we, the, the funding comes from. And there's no specific allocation to, to get things done for WGAVU. If they're coming on board and it doesn't have a feature, then then that agency contributes and other agencies benefit um the other one was it gave us insights across a uh, user journeys in that using that silo approach a, a an agency knows very well how a, a, the community is using their website but having that whole of government website you can see where there's an actual a, um, relationship between two agencies and how a, a citizens transact with them um much like the other guys, I, I would say that the open source part was um, made it easier to to experiment with whole of government. It was a risk less risk. Well, there was less risk because we didn't have to outlay to begin with. Um, but in the last couple of years, it's it's demonstrated the power of open source in its community and demonstrated the power of public cloud. And we would never have been able to do this with that public cloud and a both in its development and also in its management since we've had COVID, um, we have moved from between three and 600 continuous users to six or 7,000 continuous users. And when we have a lockdown event that can go up to 45,000 continuous users and you see those servers start to spin up and they, uh, we could never have done that using any other any other method or approach. So, yeah. yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm sure, Nathan, you can attest to the the usage of some of these uh, sites, especially during this COVID period. So uh, and I guess what, you go for it. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, the, the, the numbers, as Bill said, they're astonishingly high. Um, but yeah, we've had to put some um, sort of layers of infrastructure around Drupal to it does give us that resilience but um, if we didn't have the underlying feature set of Drupal in behind that that would have been a whole lot more difficult yeah absolutely um, so we've heard a little bit about how it's worked for that you as the agencies is there any specific functionality that suited your users or audiences right um, you know, is there something specific that Drupal drew uh, for your audiences um, happy for anyone to kind of take that question to start this one if that's yep. okay I'm, look i'm I'm a, I'm a little old school when it comes to drupal and i i, I have to say this the thought that was ever in drupal is views um because, because you can do so much with it um it can be a little overwhelming at times and for a less experienced site admin or, or a less experienced content publisher uh, yeah it's it's easy to break stuff because you kind of get it a little bit wrong but once you figure it out man you can do some pretty amazing stuff with it and there's a real big payoff there because content editors can just focus on managing the content that they're actually responsible for. If, if those views are really well defined and well built and integrated into the rest of the site, all of that kind of supporting content and landing pages and uh, indexes for things can, can all be created automatically. And estimate the value that that, that provides. Um, you know, it, it, basically, the site can almost look after itself other than just, I'm just going to publish my content. You know, here's my latest media release. It's going to get 
um, sort of distributed into the, into the correct parts of the site. You don't even necessarily need to know or remember where it goes. So it's a big, powerful thing. Um, I'm actually going to change tack a little bit, though, in terms of functionality. It's it's the reusable functionality. Um, I think Bill mentioned this as well with the, the, the sort of the COVID response and, and Pip, you, you've reflected on this in terms of the, the consistency that we're getting by sharing and reusing things. Um, it gives government some transferable skills in a situation like we're in now with the COVID response. Um, if government needs to move resources around from project to project, agency to agency, um, the training overhead to do that is, is comparatively low. Um, you know, a lot of the features in Drupal have a fairly consistent way of, of working or functioning. The interface, okay, yes, it needs some improvements. The admin interface, like Dries reflected on earlier, you know, yeah, it, it needs some enhancement, um, but there's a degree of consistency in there. And it also then means that resources can pick up stuff quickly. I would add to that, that if you have that whole of government platform, you can save in machinery of government changes. And one agency saved half a million bucks the rest what they estimated so so when, yeah it, it's amazing how much you can save when you start to add up where if you if you consolidate into that whole of government look and feel then then machinery of government becomes a non-issue yeah yeah absolutely i mean the power of the uh, the views to be automating things and aggregating definitely is a fantastic feature there and pip maybe from you what, what suited uh, your audience and, and users in terms of well, Drupal? All, all of our contents assembled from paragraph modules um we're using so um our view js front end uh, is calling on that headless interface, but we are actually now starting to see other government agencies using non Vue.js um, um, calls as well. So it's kind of broadening out beyond just our, our implementation, which is great. Um, the other big win for us actually has been, it's kind of maybe a bit mundane, but it's been the publication feature. So we um, a, a, a publication feature that we've leveraged off the book module. Um, so across the Victorian government, and I don't think we'd be alone here, um, there were a lot of PDFs and they came in the form of annual reports, you know, monthly reports, daily reports, minutely reports. <laughs> there were a lot of reports. Um, they were hard to read on mobile and they cost a lot to produce. Um, so we've, we've put together a publication feature based on that book module um, that allowed long form information to be presented in a more user friendly way. So since then, we've created 130 publications using that rather than making PDFs. Um, so a, a good example of that one is the Family Violence Reform Rolling Action Plan that we did. You can have a look at that online. Um, but yeah, that's really saved our bacon quite a lot. No, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of reporting in um, in government, and especially with oh, annual reports, yeah. it all has to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it needs to it needs to be readable. It needs to be accessible. So absolutely, absolutely, really yes. Okay, no, absolutely. And I guess now moving on to the next question about, uh, I would I would say that you guys are experienced power users of Drupal, so maybe some feedback on, on improvements in Drupal, and maybe if Dries is listening, you can <laughs> listen here, but um, any, any, where do you think Drupal can be improved? And uh, maybe Pip, you first can, uh, can answer that if, if you like. Yeah, sure. And again, you know, clocking that our particular instance, the way we're using Drupal obviously determines where we think it should be improved. But um, we've spent, we, we spend a lot of effort in that CMS. Um, and for instance, this year, we've just done a big piece of content, a big piece of work, sorry, um, around making, I mean, but at the high level, it's really about trying to make the creation of content easier for users of different of different capability. Um, so what we're trying to do is hide, hide little used um, applications from people who aren't going to use them, um, but also then trying to make those sorts of things available to people who can use them. Um, so we've done, I guess, a lot of work creating wizards to enable the easier creation of content by, remember, we've got, what, what was it, 500 CMS users currently and rising. Um, so that sort of stuff, putting in things like a dashboard around the CMS, that whole thing about making the dashboard, the CMS public and, and the authoring process just a lot easier for, for people to use. That's, that's, please, please, anything you can do in that space. <laughs> No, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, anything from you, Bill? 
Um, yeah, when I was thinking about that question, it was more around pain points, but I agree with Pip. The, I, I uh, self-authoring, giving, empowering our authors to do more and be more creative, and not tie it to needing developers to give that extra functionality. Uh, the the improvement part, whatever I say, there's going to be a module for it. So and and maybe there's too many modules. Um, I uh, I you know, but how you use that platform is 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 driven by what value you want out of it. So for me, it is always going to be performance, even though we we have the infrastructure behind pushing it. Um, there's always a lag when we scale and as the, the infrastructure comes up. And from a technical point of view, it's the telemetry, the logging, the more logging, the better, the more we can get ahead of a, um, any potential issues. Um, the more time we have to resolve that a, is, is going to be helpful because a, as we have found out, we moved from a, an informational website where we could be down for hours, and I don't think anybody would have noticed, to where uh, the premier is on the phone to my boss within 15 minutes asking why is the site slow or where is that where is that document? Um, so it, it's it, we've moved from something that was governmenty to where people complain if the if it's done. So it's it's yeah I, I don't know what to say more instrumentality so that we know that there's going to be issues coming up or we can fix them better absolutely excellent and um nathan any um yes joris if you're listening bring on claro please <laughs> <Do it quickly. laughs> um sorry uh, <laughs> I, I, another another comment i'm going to reflect on pain point again because oh, sorry also if everyone's asking this is caesar he's my cat and one of my offsiders um um web forms so i'm going to give you a user story as a site admin i need to set up my site to collect personal information from citizens i want to use the admin ui to configure a separate production database where the information can be stored so that when my developers clone the live website to work on the next feature I've asked for, there's no need to sanitize the database as they don't get access to it in the first place. Now, this is entirely possible today, but it relies on a bit of a heavy technical solution, maybe you know, integrating with a third-party CRM or some other kind of tool set. And that's really good for heavyweight transactional sites that have a lot of incoming queries or, or, or it has to connect to a really solid workflow. But government's also got a lot of stuff that kind of falls in between forms on our website. Yeah, they're really relatively straightforward. But we've got a lot of government agencies and programs that need to collect information, do it securely. And sometimes it's kind of personal sensitive information as well. And doing that in a way that kind of protects the information is still a little problematic. And wouldn't it be great if a site admin could just with some basic configuration inside Drupal rather than relying on developers? Um, you know, build a web form, point it at the secure form repository, and also have, you know, the ability to say who's got access to that data. I mean, that would be pretty amazing. Yeah, um, I mean, if, if, yeah, it's the first thing I can think of is the, the have you say, you know, everyone, almost all government yep. agencies have to do a consultation at any one yep. point in time. So yeah, that's definitely, definitely interesting point. Um, I've got a couple of questions from the audience. Um, got Lee Rollins. Can each of the panelists talk a bit about their strategies for investing back into Drupal? It's an excellent question, considering that it's open source. Um, yes, uh, anyone like to, to take that question first? Maybe Nathan, it's a big or bigger um, big community. I think, cup. I think for us, really, it's about encouraging the community that we're working with to be part of that. Um, Pip, you also mentioned it, where you know agencies that are creating uh, functionality, it can be shared. Well, we're trying to encourage that as well. We're talking to agencies regularly because we know that even our current platform doesn't have all the features that it needs. Um, so if we can approach that almost like as a, I won't say a single cohort, but uh, as a coordinated cohort of, of agencies, maybe we can build a feature once, or maybe we can enhance a module and do it once. Um, and leverage the expertise in the, in the technical community still but then make sure that you know, if we're creating something, it's done in a generic way. So this is one of the things we always encourage our agencies, don't create custom modules, even if you're a, a PaaS customer and have that ability on our platform, 
um, you know, created in a way that you could actually put that on Drupal.org and let others use it. Um, or don't go off and create something custom when there's a perfectly good module out there that with a slight enhancement might actually sort of complete your requirement set. Yeah, exactly. Open standards and, and reusable, uh, thinking reusable as much as possible, absolutely. Uh, Pip, do you have any questions on yeah, how? I, I think, yeah, no, I think, I mean, certainly to that point of reusability, um, and, and the, the notion that we would stop duplication, you know, completely, because, you know, even I found myself saying it earlier, just earlier. Um, and, and I think the idea is, is not that we will completely stop duplication, but at least clock that it's happening and where it is, then you guide it a bit towards this, these patterns, as, you know, as both Bill and Nathan have been mentioning. Um, you know, that we can see, ah, okay, Department A needs this and they've done that. Department B, well, they really urgently need this thing, so they have to go and start building tomorrow. Quick, let, you know, get them to do that. But we think we're heading towards C, so why don't we ask them to build it a little bit differently so that it can get there easier? So we, we kind of then have, because we're, on a, we're using shared technology, we can um, have a shared vision and, and bring our knowledge and experience to bear and build, hopefully, better things that then yeah can be can be reused absolutely mm -hmm. and i guess any, being as it's open source of drupal anyone can use any of the you know any of the work that's been developed by government so let's definitely yeah. uh give back and yeah bill the, there is a the, so now we deliberately built our own a uh, workflow module and they, we were going to give it back to the community and then we saw that there were better workflow flow modules <laughs> out there and they scrapped it so a um mm -hmm. Yeah, we would love to, but we're we're a consumer of the of a Drupal. We we support Drupal. Um, that's why we're here today. Um, a, we we invest in, in companies in Perth, Australia, and, and in Victoria, um, a, um, because we see the value of Drupal. Um, Nathan brought up a good point. Um, while I know that there's Drupal government groups out there, I don't really have an understanding of how they collaborate. Um, well, we, we collaborate with Victoria in, in APIs and we collaborate with the federal government with regards to identity and it's very active. So it actually triggered me that, yeah, we, we should actually work together to at least design the stuff and be aware of what each other's doing so that then we can we can either build it ourselves or, or build it for everybody else. So yeah, thank you for that, that was good. Excellent, excellent. So at the very least, we've got uh, more jurisdictions talking to each other. <laughs> uh, so we've got another question from Drew Robinson. Um, he's mentioned, Bill, I've worked on Drupal in WA state government as an agency that was uninterested moving to Drupal. I'd, like to, I'd be interested to know if there's any strategy on how to increase engagement of some of the more resistant agencies. This is probably an interesting topic. About um, well, we have many, we have many panels we have we actually have a policy where if an agency spends more than a hundred thousand then they need to go for an exemption to before they can uh, not come onto the platform um, that that's one way but then we see that some agencies might might be uh, a, uh, extending the length of their uh, website or uh, breaking their projects down into small components and thus they're extending the life of that website um, the main one is that we're, we're getting momentum, um, that, that people are coming on board because it's cost them too much to run outside of the, the, the platform. They have to justify what, why they want that extra three or 400 or 900. In fact, one of them saved 930,000 a year just by moving onto the platform. So, um, so it's becoming harder and harder and the message is getting is a lot easier since COVID. Um, so we have the, the DGs, the governance around how we operate, the DGs are starting to talk about, well, why aren't we on it? And it's only the technical arguments that are coming back. So that they should start to break down in the next couple of years. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. And, and just jumping back to the um, the contrib uh, question there, I guess, is that obviously there's contrib between the different jurisdictions uh, and, and the work and the programs that they have. I guess is um, how do you see if there's any savings that agencies or uh, are receiving because they're obviously building within um, you know within their modules. Is there any way to kind of give back to the wider community? Right. If there's a savings there, is there some way to contribute directly? back into the, the Drupal community 
Um, is there anything that, that you guys have in place that could give back uh, to the wider community rather than just the, the programs that you have there? Akil, I'm yeah, from the I'm Department from... of Finance. That's a weird question. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, so, so I guess it's more about that. Do you have requirements about you know, vendors to contribute back directly to? So vendors maybe uh, contributing back to Drupal, not, not just the agencies. We've certainly taken that approach with some of the engagements we've had with commercial suppliers where maybe they've volunteered to contribute some hours in kind to like maybe reduce the cost of a project but actually progress something. Um, and obviously we're always amenable to that. Um, the whole question of savings is a complicated thing for government because often it gets tied directly to their budgets and for us directly, like we're not actually interested in scooping up their savings, we would rather see them take those savings and, and invest them somewhere else in their program. Um, if anything, though, what it may do is give them some extra resources to actually do some more work. And maybe that's where the the investment back is. It's like they're, they're actually able to progress things a little more than if they didn't have those savings in the first place. And it, it sort of, I think sometimes it just comes down to, um, you know, where your focus and your effort is you know, so I think we've found that we have been able to um, contribute back in on an ad hoc fashion, like it's no no dedicated program of work, but we have been able to build patches and fixes um, for, for the modules that we use. And as you're building and, and working on stuff, if you see something that you can easily fix, then it does, you know, we are able to put that back in. But like I say, I guess it's because we've got a consolidated piece of work going on in this space. Um, and, and I think that as we see the uptake sort of, for instance, in Victorian government, as we see that uptake kind of spread across the government, we'll start to see, I would, I would hope and expect, we would start to see more of that because it's just the nature of the, it's the nature of the game, you know, the nature of the open source game. You see the benefit from being able to make the most of the great work that somebody else did six months ago. You go, oh, great, I like that. You know, and that's our great starting point. So when you've done something that's fixed some bug, you kind of go, oh, if somebody else is going to want to use that. We'll put it back. Excellent. No, that's right. Exactly. Now, now just looking at the time, we're going to go to our last question, I guess. And so more about, um, you know, looking looking forward now and, and what are you guys hoping to achieve? Uh, and, and maybe maybe otherwise, um, what potential threats do you see for to Drupal within the government in the longer term? A bit of a curveball there. Happy for anyone to take that. I'll I'll, I'll give it yeah, a go. Yeah, go. I'll give it a go. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to think about that curveball while I talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in terms of us for the future, we're we're at a point where we're we're um, we're at a next stage of expansion. So that's very much our focus. Um, we're all about establishing those patterns because they'll work for us. They'll save us time. They'll save us effort. They'll hopefully help us implement better things. Um, so we're looking at wherever we can, we're using existing government infrastructure. We're forging the easiest connections that we can to those things. So we're using APIs. We've got our whole of government API gateway um, and the great work that's being done there. We've got incredible geospatial services being provided by um, DELP. Um, the, the, the department of too many letters, and we're um, we're using you know our core products like DataVic um, to kind of both promote the use of open data, but also it's our main sort of funnel for the dynamic data that we bring into our visualizations. So setting up those patterns, um, I mean the, these are they're, they're patterns with partners, I suppose, but um, as well as with the code and with the modules, we're doing the same, just looking for patterns. We've just recently, um, we've been working on a new pattern, a new data visualization pattern that's really just, we're, we're calling it a location finder. So we're knowing that Victorian government, governments all around the world always have services that are in a location and people need to find it. So when I need to find my bushfire recovery center, when I need to find my COVID testing hub, when I need to find my thing, we'll use this pattern and that will be the pattern that give me a map, give me a list, give me an accessible, usable thing that I can use on my mobile while I'm out on the street. I can use my desktop. So patterns, um, they're our way. That's what we're doing for the future. I think the other thing that will sit in support of that is a real um, extension of this developer community for us. So we've got a roadmap 
and we can only fit so many things on that roadmap but we know that working with departments they're going to, we're going to come across many things that we can't we can't help them with so we encourage them to work with developers to build and this comes back to this idea of reuse and collaboration that we're talking about so we're really going to be putting a lot of effort into the development of that community over the sort of coming period they're kind of our two big things excellent and um nathan maybe to you about the the future i guess um well yeah the future is a little uncertain isn't it <laughs> our roadmap has to be honest it's it's slowed down a little bit over the last 18 months the whole uh COVID response has been our top priority and you know, the resilience and, and uptime of the current platform has absolutely been front of mind for everybody in the team. Um, really pleased to hear Dries and his remarks this morning about some of the things that he's looking at in, in broader priorities. Um, scarily, they kind of align to what's on our roadmap at a big level. So content personalization, um, government doesn't have a lot of experience really doing this. Um, so we're looking at how do we start small? How do we kind of figure out some of the patterns that need to be useful to, to make it work? Um, APIs, uh, a lot of uh, agencies are talking about how they use APIs for uh, content aggregation and content consumption. Uh, again, they don't necessarily understand how to go about doing that. So there's a lot of work to happen in that space. Uh, that overlaps into the whole headless CMS um, implementation. Dries nailed it exactly, I think, this morning, where he said, you know, you've got that content repository and you're, and you're using that content in all sorts of different places. And it's like, that's one of the powerful things that, that Drupal can enable. So we need to tap into that. Um, and I'm going to answer your curveball a little bit, Akil. Um, <laughs> it's not so much a threat to Drupal. It's just a threat. And that's the changing cybersecurity landscape. Um, we are witnessing very dramatic shifts in cybersecurity, dare I say, malicious activity in a couple of places. Um, so front of mind for us is how do we stay in front of that as best as we can? And we're looking at things like, um, you know, static rendering of our content. So using Drupal to manage the actual uh, creation and uh, distribution of that initial content, but then statically rendering it so that you sort of put a few more layers of defenses in before um, you actually get to anything close to your database. Now, we have some ideas on how to do that, but it's still some time off for us. Excellent. So now with about 30 seconds to a minute, Bill. <laughs> yeah, OK, I'll be very quick. We have. Uh, our program of work for 11 digital strategy, uh, digital platforms. Uh, Drupal will be the content deliverer of those uh, to those platforms. Um, the threat to Drupal for us is that it's a Swiss army knife where we can do anything. And we as an organization need to define what it's going to do rather than, so we've picked any unstructured information and we're going to put our structured information in our CMSs and our, and our bigger databases. We did find that we were using it for everything, which was bad. Excellent, no, that's great. Now now we have kind of run out of time to open up to general questions, but I'll, uh, I'll start wrapping this up. Um, excellent, thank you very much all for your time. All for your time. Uh, let's quickly check if there's any questions on the Q and A. Yep. Okay. And so, I uh, just that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much to the panelists for sharing their insights and experience on Drupal. Uh, clearly, Drupal is not going to be going anywhere soon for Australian government, at least. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions or you'd like to chat to the individuals here on the panelists, um, just please get in touch with them after the session. And I think we've got a let's segue now. Yes, ready to, to thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your Drupal event today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. See you. Thanks, Akil. Uh, and thanks to, to Salsa Digital for uh, bringing us that uh, panel session. Um, coming up next is our hallway track. And uh, this is something a little bit different um, for us in the conference. Uh, while most of us are sitting um, around here in our bubbles, here's a chance to, to virtually get out and about and meet uh, some of your fellow conference people. Um, there'll be 30 minutes of a hallway track coming up. That's three times 10 minute sessions um, with breakout rooms for small group chats. Um, 
to get in there, simply exit this session, uh, click into the hallway track and join the conversation. And thank you uh, heaps to the team at Morphed for choosing to support this activity. Um, really awesome to support community and collaboration. And we appreciate you making this one possible. So I'll see you there.